Hey everyone, Steve Wondrop with Collider, and I am here with someone named Vince. Nice to see you. How are you doing today, too? Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Always great to see you. Um, I appreciate it. And what I find fascinating, you're here promoting Fighting With My Family, which is the only film that you've probably worked with a director taller than you. That's right. Stephen Merchant is the tallest director, tallest actor in the world. So it is a different perspective for me to be around him. But uh, he's, an, he's an enormously tall gentleman. He is. Yes. Um, I want to start by saying how much I enjoyed the movie, sincerely. Uh, it tells a really positive message, as well as just being an authentic movie about you know this family. Uh, talk a little bit about, are, are you a fan of wrestling? I was growing up. I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought there was such cool stuff in it. And then as I have gotten older, I kind of lost touch with it, and I wasn't as familiar with modern wrestling. I saw the documentary and I thought that was so unique about it was, you know, you have this young girl's dream, which is such a unique world that we haven't seen to go into something like wrestling. But it's like, you know, almost mythological in that it's a world across the ocean and somewhere totally foreign. And what I found most interesting that I hadn't seen is just the weight of almost like you're living out your parents' dreams. Sure. Like you inherited these goals from your family. And so here you are, not just for yourself, but ultimately like a family legacy that was like fulfilling a promise. So I found it very moving that way. And then the wrestling aspect of it, getting into it and learning about it, I just had an appreciation for the athleticism in modern wrestling, the flips and all the different stuff that they do. I mean, it's, it's odd to say, but the, the people that go into it with the passion they have, it's not like there's a long career opportunity. There's not a huge financial opportunity. I mean, very few people can make a living at it. And yet it's so challenging and so brutal on your body that I just was amazed to see the commitment that you would have with all these young girls and, and young guys entering that world. I think that a lot of people... Uh I, I think a lot of people don't give the credit that wrestling, I'm not someone who watches wrestling. However, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the athleticism that it takes to do this because you do bring up the point that it's it's like it beats your body up. But then it's also cool like you hear how like Rick Rubin with Death Jam took a lot of the wrestling selling points of creating heroes and villains or heels and kind of used that in the promotion of those artists, right? There's, there's just... There's a permeation of that culture in sort of marketing and advertising that's been, you know, kind of taken from for a lot of different industries. Completely. Talk a little bit about uh, did Stephen make you audition or was it one of these things where he said, come over, let's just have a drink or a meeting? Yeah, they, they said they, I just got a call to do it. We had ta I heard about it a while and then they came to me and asked me to do it. It was kind of short notice. The thing came together fairly quickly. So. I just kind of crammed in and went down locally in Los Angeles to some places and talked to some of those guys. And most of them were pretty banged up. You know, a lot of them were ex-wrestlers who were coaching nowadays and teaching it. So a lot of them were kind of kind of uh, banged up. And, um, yeah, then I kind of jumped in and had a blast with Steven. He's, he's terrific. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, memorable moments from filming. Uh, you have scenes with, uh, you have some great scenes with a lot of people in the film. Uh, talk a little about like a day or two you'll always remember. Well, we went to WrestleMania while it was going on, and I have not been to a, a wrestling match live prior to this. And it was just, uh, it was such a, you know, a, a, a spectacular um, event. I mean, there were so many people was in Los Angeles. So you had, I think Rick Rubin was there. You had um, just so many different people there. The writer of Braveheart was there, Randall Wallace, who I know. I was just amazed at the audience that the, that the event drew. And... Um, just the pageantry, you know, just the pageantry of how they kind of throw it was kind of awesome. And I brought my kids and my son came home like really excited. He was all of four years old at the time and he threw a chair across the uh, room because he was watching these kind of matches. So uh, uh, it was just, it was really interesting to see them do it. You're like, um, it's, it's not real. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> You're right. like, we've got to calm that down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, I get, they were telling me earlier that the first week of filming, they had to film the WrestleMania thing. That's right. Which is, it's crazy because you generally want to build, you want to get to know your character a little bit before you're performing in front of, I don't know, 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that pressure like 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 uh, uh, the actors did who were performing that. Um, you know, they were just uh, so prepared. I think they had gone to NXT and done some physical training prior to that. But yeah, I mean, you have a, the oddity of doing a live performance in front of a lot of people with high expectations and you're, you know, you're being woven in simultaneously with professionals who perform this stuff live. So I'm sure there was a lot of anxiety as far as pulling off the moves in a way that was believable. Completely. What's the, you've done, obviously, a, you've had a great career, and I'm curious, what is the, 
what have you been asked to do really early in a shoot, if you remember, that you're like, I cannot believe I have to do this in the first week? Well, love scenes come to mind. That's always, you know, you don't know someone and it's just the scheduling works out. You kind of <laughs> jump into that. So, um, and sometimes it's nice if you have like bigger performance demanding pieces to kind of get it out of the way early versus having it kind of loom. So, um, yeah, I can think of those, those kind of things popped in my mind. Uh, have you seen the finished film? I have, yeah. Uh, what was your reaction the first time? I thought it was really terrific. I love Florence in it. She's terrific, and you really root for them, and the whole family dynamic is great. You know, it's so interesting to see the common threads of parents, this kind of working class family wanting better for their children and the and children kind of inheriting this family legacy. But just the world's interesting, the journey of it. I, I think it's always one of the fun things in watching films. It's nice to be entertained. And then it's on top of that, if you can get a little bit of an education, and in this case, you're just learning about a world. So you're picking up sort of how this thing goes down and it becomes interesting because we're not overexposed to it. And then it's ultimately, I think, a, a story that's been told. It's sort of the, a hero's journey that you have sort of this, this girl with her doubts and fears and the facing of those, and then ultimately the um, resurrection of her into this sort of you know, um, realized dream. Uh, I'm a big fan of Steven. Uh, I think he's really talented both in front of the camera and behind the camera. Uh, what was it like working with him? And Because uh, uh, as an actor, I'm curious what kind of notes he gives on set. He was terrific. He was very collaborative. You know, the, the script was still kind of going through stuff as we were working. So we talked a lot about, um, you know, just the wrestling, how to how to incorporate the information in a way that doesn't feel too expository and kind of what her journey is. So there was lots of really good conversations and, and playing around with stuff uh, as far as uh, finding the best ways to try to, you know, get across the points and, and keep it on story or keep it fun. Uh, we are here at Sundance. Yes. Uh, I'm very curious. Uh, how many have you been, How many times have you been here? I have not. You know, I told this earlier, but uh, we made the movie Swingers and Sundance was a destination. We did not get into Sundance. And then the first movie that John directed, the first movie I produced was called Made, and that did not get into Sundance. So um, we are here now with this, with Fighting With My Family. And I don't know if I had come one time younger or not. But, uh, yeah, I do not have a long, a long history with the festival. Uh, I was going to say, it's, it's, it's pretty shocking. I mean, also, the, the, uh, Dwayne Johnson's coming in for this, so he has a Sundance movie as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's it's right. crazy. That's right. That's you know right. what I mean? You look at the movies that he does right now, and you're like, none of these are going to Sundance. Right. And the, uh, here we are. <laughs> yes, <You're> exactly. Right. <laughs> um, it's crazy. Uh, what is it like for you, though? You're what we call tall. Yes. And there's a lot of people here that like seeing celebrities. Yes. You can't really blend in as far as I can tell well I've been able to kind of put this kind of terrific ski coat with this hood and I can kind of dip it if I need to move quickly through places but people here are really they seem to be film enthusiasts and people are very friendly so I've, I've enjoyed saying hi to people on the street people here are kind of um, seem very nice so it's, it's been uh, been pretty easy with the uh, with Sundance being so many movies are world premiering here as a film fan which I know you love movies do you try to come in a few days early or stay a day late to just like see movies or is your schedule not allow it? Well, as you know, that's the oddity, right? That the original fun of a film festival, which used to be more this way, um, was that you would get a chance to see other people's work and you would get a chance to see people sometimes. And that is not as common anymore. So much of the festivals now are people promoting and talking about their films that your, your schedule's um, pretty filled up with uh, um, talking about your movie. So unfortunately, you don't get a chance to check out stuff. But um, I've heard of some things. You were saying a movie that you liked earlier. Yeah, like Late Night. Late Night you liked. Yeah, that was great. Anything else that you've seen that kind of pops? Yeah, Shia LaBeouf was great in Honey Boy. Honey Boy, I heard also, that was good, which, yeah. Which he also wrote. Yeah. I saw Blinded by the Light last night, which was great. If you yeah. like Springsteen, you're going to love it. That's cool. This has been a good year. That's great. You know? Um, everyone who's been coming in, we've been doing something called a Get to Know Your Sundance Attendee. Okay. And I swear these are harmless questions. I'm happy to be, to be harmless. Or unharmed. Yeah, here we go. Uh, what TV show would you love to guest star on? Boy, gosh, I'm doing one recent. I'm about to do one that I'm kind of excited about that I think will be fun. Can you? Can you? I don't know if I can. I'm yeah, I was going to say, don't get in trouble. I can't get in trouble, but I'm yeah. about to do one. Uh, a couple of things. Oh, on something she's like, no. she's like, no, I can't. Okay, so yes. <laughs> so I can't say, but I, right. but you'll see. Got it. Do you have a favorite sci-fi or fantasy film? That's a great question. A favorite one. Gosh. Yeah, like one so that top you... of my head just because it came sure. to it. I, and, and, and I always preface this by saying it might be my favorite in this moment, but allowing that that could change, that I could have another. Of course. Planet of the Apes came to mind. I remember really being impacted by that movie as a kid with the whole 
um, you know, twists sure. and turns and realization ultimately that there was a Statue of Liberty. Great writer, obviously, Rod Sterling from Twilight Zone did that. But that was a terrific film. Uh, do you have a favorite? What is, your, what is yours? Oh, man, the, the problem with that is... I know, but you have to just say one now at the top of your head because I could go on I, too. I still, I still, I mean, listen, like I could mention 2001. I could right. mention all of these things. But I, I really, I've watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the extended editions, way too many times. That would have and, to go number one then at And this I, point. I really think that Peter Jackson and what they did with that trilogy is just so amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it was just for me. But I mean, Did look, you read the books younger? Uh, no, I, I actually have not read the books. Um, and I haven't watched read the Game of Thrones books, and but I love the show. Right, right. But I mean, look, the and, and as you know, as a film fan, the you it's it's so difficult because you talk about a movie that is the precursor that built that everyone built on, like a two thousand one, you know, or right. do you? Well, that's the thing that happens is one is built on the other, like folk exactly. music or anything. So when you pay homage to one, you're doing it to all, right? Yeah. For sure. Um, do you have a favorite superhero movie? That's a good question. Do I have a favorite superhero movie? You know, I've kind of checked out watching them as recently. And I guess the stuff that would have impact, impacted me maybe was the stuff that you would see younger. Um, like the Donner Superman? Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of a favorite. And I'm, I'm sort of, it's hard because you have different ones that you like. Um, maybe I'll go, uh, maybe I'll go with the first Iron Man because, uh, you know, you know someone that obviously be, Favreau yeah. and, and, and Bill and Peter Billingsley produced that, but I also thought it was inventive. I hadn't seen a superhero movie done that way. Uh, you know, in a way, it kind of became the pilot for a lot of the Marvel movies, where you have a balance of humor and stuff in it. So maybe I'll go with that one. I think that um, John and everyone involved in that movie does not get enough credit for what that movie did, because a lot of people don't realize, I'm, I, if I'm not mistaken, Marvel took out like a five hundred million dollar loan to make three movies. And if they didn't work, they were going to lose all the characters. They yeah, were my understanding was that when they made that film, that you know, no one really knew what would happen. It was sort of a lesser known of the Marvel titles at the time. It, you know, it wasn't Spider Man or, or something that was as well known, and so there was some risk involved. Um, and again, I think they tonally did something a little bit different. You know, they brought some comedy and different sure. tone to it. And as you know, with, with watching movies, tone is everything. If you establish a tone, it's a tricky thing, right? You got to stay within that. So uh, I'll go with I'll go with that. Do you collect anything? I'm not a real big collector. I do have a collection of some sports stuff, just because I, I produce a uh, interview show with um, with athletes, and so I, I get some signed stuff as it goes. But I'm not I'm not a, a big collector. Younger, I was more of a collector. Sure. Do you remember? I played Dungeons and Dragons and those kind of games, so I used to get those kind sure. of uh, lead things. Sure. You know, there's a huge popularity of Dungeons and Dragons again now. A lot of people play. What's fascinating about that is it was sort of the first perspective of the of the single player. You know, now you see a lot of the video games and stuff that people play, but that was the first game that I remember sort of introducing a world where you were a character and, there, and, and sort of navigating it or an avatar, if you will. Totally. So it was like before that, and I always found those guys interesting, Gary Gygax and that crowd out no, of Wisconsin, you're, right? Yeah, Did you, you find them interesting? You, you dropped the name. That story, He's the guy. That story is so, but without them and that role-playing game, you probably wouldn't have, whether it's Grand Theft Auto or any of these things that have, that have come into such popular. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. Do you remember your first movie or TV show crush? Gosh, my first movie or TV show crush. I don't know if it was a crush, but I remember seeing Paper Moon as a kid and really being taken by thinking she was interesting, Tatum O'Neill, um, and loving that character in that film. I was very young. I remember thinking, like, she's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't know what this means, but it means something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you own any movie or TV show props? Do I own any? I have stuff probably from films, but I don't. I don't really check on it, so I can't say. And I'm not a. I don't purchase things, so nothing comes to mind. But I know I have probably some things somewhere. Sure. Uh, background photo on your phone. It's just the thing it comes with. Unfortunately, I am too analog. I, I should. Oh no, no. I have a picture of my daughter, my daughter from when she was uh, a, one of the pictures from when she was uh, I think a, a year old. It's me holding her. I just you know I never owned a cell phone until I was married in the first Father's Day. My wife gave it to me because I never owned one. And then I remember when I first started taking pictures, it was with my my daughter. So I have a, a, a my, my phone saver is her. Was there but a, on my computer, it's still like the mountain. I don't know where they took that shot, by the way. Right, well, well, you know, everyone's like the same mountain with the lake. There's no one lives there. Right, no, it's, right, just, it's just, just like an uninterrupted un nature. Yeah. I don't know where it is. What, what was your aversion to getting the phone or was it just you just had no interest? I, I You know what it was is I always felt like I didn't love being able to be reached at any time. 
you know, I didn't want that. I was kind of, and so I always felt like, well, God, the answer machine always worked. Like this isn't broken. Like someone leaves a message and at some point you check it and you get back to them. Sure. And the whole phone thing to me felt like I'm going to carry a phone. You know, it was so funny. So I just never did it. And then, you know, obviously now that I do it, like everybody else, you do kind of rely on it more. Completely. I think that even if you don't, I think there's an addiction to social media, but I do think that having a phone for emergencies is really important. No question. You know? and as the, social media, some of it's good, I guess, you know, um, but there's also just websites or news or you're able to get information so quickly. So I like that. Or if you're curious about something, the ability to look something up and read about it is nice to have. But then you can spend a lot of time. You can go down a, a foxhole, as they say, and com- com- deep dive. Yes. Completely. Yes. What TV show have you watched all the way through more than once? Well, the stuff for me that I would go back to is still like Sanford and Son, which was not obviously, you know, um, it was sort of one-offs. But I probably watch that show more than any other show. Sure. Uh, These are some this or that. Okay. So Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Uh, Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad? Game of Thrones. Uh, Han Solo or Indiana Jones? Han Solo. You are very decisive. Yes. I, uh, there's a lot I'm of I'm just trying to go with what comes to the first of my oh, mind. Oh, because some people will sit there and literally, like, they have, like, the look of, you know, they're going to the bathroom. Sure. Like, they're just, it's they, challenging. But, yeah. you know, again, I always say, like, I just go with, like, I could feel differently at a different time. Because no. you're talking about some 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 pretty fun uh, this or that. Do you remember uh, what, as a kid, or when you were younger, uh, uh, what got you interested in the entertainment industry? Was it, like, a performance? Was it a movie? Was there something that said, oh, my God, I want to do that? You know, looking back, if I can connect to it, I had, I, I remember my, my dad really liked movies, my mom, and I would watch old movies, and they kind of let me watch stuff. I was the youngest, so I would see stuff that was not necessarily age appropriate, both in the theater and as well at, at home. And I really was just drawn to the storytelling and obviously the dynamics of the characters. And then my family did something interesting where they would reenact a scene, my, like just, you know, this was before, but one of the family things we would do is say, okay, everyone's going to audition for the Tin Man. Like just in the living room. So you get up and do it, then someone else gets up and do it. And I always found that to be fun. It was kind of like just playing games, but we would sort of act out, you know, characters from a Western and everyone would kind of take their turn at it. So it was a way to kind of laugh with your family. Um, and so I enjoyed that. And so movies and, and going to, I was very fortunate. My, my family took me to a lot of plays and stuff younger. So I was always exposed to it. And I always just enjoyed um, the feelings that you got in watching stories play out and the imagination of it. And then I think getting involved in kind of role-playing games and that kind of stuff was a continuation of that. Uh, you know how much I loved Assault in Cell Block 99. I loved. Uh, I am anxiously awaiting seeing Dragged Across Concrete. Please tell me when people can see it. I'm not sure. I, uh, it's a cool movie. We went to um, Beyond Fest with it. Um, the movie played at the Venice Film Festival as well. Zoller is my favorite. He's such a tremendous storyteller. Um, and it's cool. It's it's a, a different kind of movie. Um, he does his own sort of uh, unique story with this as it's different from kind of, you know, I think in the same palette but different than Bone Tomahawk, which I, which I loved. Um, and uh, it's cool. He does all the original music for it again, composed all of the original music. I believe the OJs are back performing with him. So there's a lot of cool stuff in it. And Mel's terrific in the film. Yeah, I heard Mel can act. Yes, very much so. He's, he's okay. Yeah, he's tremendous. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so there's basically so there's no word in terms of like a release date. I don't know. I know Lionsgate has it. The movie, in, in, in uh, classic Zoller form, the movie is long, and Zoller likes it that way. So he's, you know, he kind of makes these movies, and I think it's great, but he kind of makes these movies and sort of locks them uh, to his own taste. You know, same with Cell Block. There's no real testing or anything. Same with Bone Tomahawk. So uh, Zoller kind of intended to make a movie like this, and it's exactly what he made. I seriously cannot wait to see it, especially with how awesome Cell Block 99 is. If you don't mind, I just have a few fun ones. Please. Okay, here we go. Uh, by the way, thank you for being uh, so indulgent. Okay, today. sure. I really appreciate it. Uh, would you rather see your movie before its festival premiere? or go into the premiere screening blind? Gosh, I guess either way is fine. I guess I, I, you kind of watch it and the first time you're seeing it, I'm not as precious with that. Maybe because I've been through the editing room process on the other side as well. You kind of know what that experience is like. So I kind of like seeing things with an audience though. So I enjoy watching something with other people there responding. I like that that experience. So I would be fine either way. I gotta, I'm got i going to rewind a second. Please. I was at the TIFF 
premiere of Cell Block 99, and I remember I was sitting, I think, a row or two behind you, and you, I, and you were having so much fun watching, and the crowd was going bananas. And I just remember seeing you just looked like you were having a blast. Well, it's always interesting because there was people, you know, cheering at parts that I didn't expect. And that's what's so fun when you see it with an audience, it sort of takes on a life of its own. And, you know, that's the thing I think with films and, and having that experience is sometimes people will inform you about sense of humor or what's scary or ideas, you know, you sort of take on um, kind of a group consciousness. So that was fun because it was like, you know, they were here you're breaking people's arms or sure. doing things to prison guards and I and these people were really rooting for Bradley and I just found that to be kind of like oh that's interesting yeah. it was awesome yeah uh, would you rather uh, would you rather walk around Sundance with no gloves or wet boots no gloves would be preferable <laughs> uh, would you rather meet a new collaborator at a festival or reconnect with someone you've worked with before interesting um, both could be exciting probably uh, probably a new collaboration uh i have a lot of great old collaborations that i continue with and i hope those continue but it's always exciting to meet someone new and and uh get inspired by by uh some new ideas would you rather uh do festival interviews with a co-star that talks too much or not enough boy that's a great question that thank you perry you can answer that question probably better <laughs> than anybody i would assume probably talks too much is preferable but I can't say it as an absolute. Now, in your experience in interviewing, you probably notice a lot of times yeah, I, where uh, people are sitting together and making it like things are fantastic. But you could probably tell there's some trouble at the dinner table with these two, <laughs> right? I have noticed that. It's also, you know something? It's now, how do you navigate that? Uh, it's Listen, the fact is, if you're doing an interview like this, where yes. it's extended, it doesn't matter. Right. When you're doing a four-minute interview at the Four Seasons or whatever, and they're in a room, and there's four people, and you have four minutes... I mean, not to curse, but you're fucked. Right. Because if one person just talks for two minutes, which is, I'll give you a great story. Please. I saw, I interviewed for Age of Ultron, uh, James Spader, and I think Paul Bettany. And I asked like a harmless question, like, what's the worst job you've had? And James Spader, who I love, gave a four minute answer. Right. And then they're like, you're wrapped. And I'm like, I have not asked about the movie. And they're like, oh, you can ask one more thing. But it was one of these things where... I couldn't believe James just kept talking. Oh, he like, continued with the second question. No, no, no. He, he, Who put a nickel in James that right, day, right? But it was just four minutes on his worst job. And it was like listening. Have you seen The Blacklist? Yes. Okay. It was like sitting across <laughs> from, from uh, Reddington just it being James Spader and him tell, acting like Reddington just going on. And I'm like, this what is amazing. Was Paul, did Paul seem happy by this? He, he seemed like, I don't think he was frustrated. Right. But it was one of these, like, I think he was smiling a little bit like, this is just James. Yeah. But it was, it's very difficult because yes. I can't interrupt him. Right. I'm, You're giving what's called kind of a first question to kind of break the ice. Yeah, it was, a, it was an icebreaker. A little background flavor. Yes. Now you're going to get to the meat, which is tell me about your point of view on whether it was a performance or the movie, how it came together. And guess what? Everyone got full on the appetizers. It was uh, bananas, but there's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. You, nothing. Nothing you can do. Uh, would, you rather, would you rather mess up every take yourself or have yeah. someone mess up your best take? Interesting. Would you rather mess up every... I guess I would rather have someone mess up my best take because I would like to feel always that I'm prepared and ready to go. And what you describe mess up to me might mean something different because I think it's really about listening and reacting and you don't necessarily know always where it's going to go. So sometimes what appears to be a mess up can be a great thing. I'm assuming if you forget lines or stumble and, and depending on the director of the film, that can actually turn out to be okay too. But um, I do appreciate it and I guess I would, as much as you don't like someone kind of doing that, but I'd, I'd rather feel that, that I was uh, on par versus Versus the one kind of bringing everybody down. I totally get it. Uh, would you rather would you rather have to cry or laugh in a scene? Well, um, I guess they're similar. That you want to find a way in that feels like it's happening, you know, truthfully. Um, both can dry up, so you want to be prepared to kind of be ready and then have something spark you and and kind of be ready to go and as as that goes on in either case it can start to dry up and then you have to try to find new things um, and both can be tiring but as I 
As I try to think about it out loud, I guess I would rather, well, I guess I'd rather laugh because that's a more fun day. <laughs> sure. Right? And you're kind of <laughs> in a lighter mood and you can kind of joke around and be, put yourself in a good place because that kind of works with, with what you're stepping into. And uh, the crying, you know, you're trying not to cry, but you have to get yourself kind of in a headspace that's sometimes not, you don't, not a great place to live in. Can, can you cry on command? Or, I don't know if I do it on command, but, but you know what I, I mean. Like, can you bring it? Like, if, if you have to, it's a strange thing. I don't even you don't even analyze. It's like you kind of build up a. Well, everyone has their different techniques for how they do it, right? So yes, I, I can. I feel very confident to go into a scene and emotionally be available, depending on what it calls for. Sure. Um, I could ask you a million other things, but you have to do what's called other interviews and yes. other things. So yes. I'm just going to say, because I messed up at the beginning, a huge thank you to Kia Telluride. They're our sponsor, and uh, they're the only reason I get to be at Sundance and why Collider is here. So huge thank you to Kia Telluride, which is right here. Just giving them a nice plug because, you know, they have a new car coming out in September. In case Very you didn't nice. know. Very looks nice. Looks a little Range, Rover, Range Rover-esque. Yes. Uh, but seriously, thanks. But m more importantly... Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Sincerely, always great for coming to see in. you, pal. Appreciate and it. Congrats on the movie. Thank you, like, brother. I think people are going to really love it. I appreciate that. Um, thanks. thanks. Have a great day. Yep, we'll see you soon.